But there is a commonality of the human experience that reminds us that there's something more going on in this world. And I think good art hopefully can change that where there's the, the veil peels back for a moment and you realize you're not just random cosmic stardust, um, mm. you know, who came about for their own reasons. In music, we're reminded that there maybe all of this began with a, a better purpose and a higher goal and it's moving towards something better. So that's for us, like doing that with an audience, like trying to make music that does that for us and tell stories that are doing that for us and sharing that with people, hopefully it makes us all better. So we're all swimming in AI. And I don't think it's particularly dangerous if you're aware of how it works. If you're onto the tricks that are being employed, they don't work, right? There's a, there's a conscious engagement in that type of magic that you can reject. I can tell you, you can pray for me because uh, <laughs> I, I'm hoping that I can actually sing that song without crying. Because if I cry, I don't sound very good. <laughs> oh no, okay. But the song, that song, uh, out of all of them, makes me very emotional. Look who we have here. Ooh, Neil, you got some who friends. Are we? Who are these people? Oh my goodness. Dirt Poor Robbins, the band, not just the duo, the band joins us today. Oh it is exciting to have you guys. How are you doing? Good, doing good. good. So good. Yeah. How are you? You know, I, I'm so excited to be talking with you guys, but I'm even more excited to be able to go to a live show down in Florida when we meet for the Symbolic World Summit. I'm excited for that too. Well, that's why we're again. That's why we're all here. We're we're rehearsing, you know, the Daytona Beach area. Um, and I, we brought Dave's been. This is David Lachance. In case you don't know, because obviously I'm Neil. This is Kate. If you've Hello. seen us on the channel, this is David Lachance. He's actually related. This is a nepotism move of nepotism, but he's actually the most competent musician I know. That's right. And so he was a easy that's first right. call, first pick when it came time to play. But Dave's played with us in the past, right? Yeah. Since the yeah. 90s. We Since the going, 90s, Dave's been We're going us. back to the beginning. It's pretty crazy. All right. Over here, over, over here we have uh, Melky, 5Z, Oz, whatever you want to call him. No, uh, Tay Tay. Yep. He, <laughs> and though you were laughing, he made sound. That's the first time the whole week. It's been very strange having him here because I think he was burned like in a vat of acid, like a Batman villain, Whoa. and it was holding a disco ball at the time. So now this is who we have, and but he's a whiz when it comes to lighting, special effects, DJing, uh, sampling. So our in-house superhero. He's covering everything we can't cover live. That guy. Awesome, but I'm just wondering, like, what is it like with you guys live? Like for people that are going to be there, what can they expect? Uh, I wouldn't expect any. I'd set your expectations very low, so it's easier to be impressed. Wait, where did this thumb come from on the screen? Hey. Somebody give us a thumbs up. That's incredible. Okay, yeah. so, so uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> what is this? Because you keep making it, and it doesn't matter. Oh my gosh, really? <laughs> oh, whoa. whoa. I, Things are happening. I did something, <laughs> and I'm People are just tuning right? in okay, so. on audio alone. You are missing out. There's like a fireworks yeah. thumb show here. Yeah, I, we don't know. Sorry, so that's what the, actually, that's a better example of what the show's going to be like, <laughs> would be the fireworks. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so I think we're a little more than a normal like pop rock band. It's a little more vocal driven, you know, harmonies, uh, vocals, uh, that sort of element. I think this time we're bringing we're bringing some, uh, you know, more mood changes and dynamic lighting into the set, which is something we normally didn't do in the past. Normally we always relied heavily on our own performances. Um, so it's kind of a, it's going to be a three ring circus. Uh, you're going to get a little bit of everything. Um, I'm bringing a guitar, which oh. for anyone who knows, really complicated instrument. Yeah. So. That's gonna really one excite keyboard. people. Oh man, Kate's gonna steal the show, man. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we're doing those things, and uh, that's expectation. So we're gonna actually, hopefully, if we get ahead of ourselves practice wise, because we play more time than we needed, we're gonna record the set like in the studio style and release those to YouTube. So we people are. will get some sort of what? I didn't know. Pressures didn't know. on. Didn't so know. we're gonna do some of that kind of stuff. Hopefully, create some other content. So uh, it's amazing how many people. Uh, don't who follow us and listen to the band actually don't even know what we look like. Maybe they wouldn't follow us if they knew. I know. So, uh, that way. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it's funny because like, we've even had times in life where I've met up with someone who started talking about the band to me and didn't know that I was in the band. So uh, more, you know, some live content, actually getting to see us perform the music. Hopefully that helps people connect to the music in a different way. Because in this day and age, you don't know what you're hearing when you get a recording. Like, is this person been auto-tuned? 
into oblivion has the drummer been edited to where he actually sounds like he's on time so the wonderful thing about getting to be in front of people is you show them like hey look this is this is what we record what we record is what we play now and you be the judge all right so how many people are going to be on stage for the band oh uh, just the You're four of us yeah Ooh, just all right you know yeah, uh, I mean, when we were touring back in the day, we had what five in the band. We had we had times where we did shows with many twelve people. Like we had a brass section come up and oh, other right. background vocalists. So we've done all kinds of stuff. We normally do some. We we normally have perishability in our show. So if you don't see that show, you miss something that will only happen once. Oh. So for all the people coming, that'll be a one one off. The way we do the set list, the way we do everything, it'll be a one off. They're the only ones who get to see it. Wow. Okay, it's like a special edition. I'm really excited because it, like Neil is the one that engages online and with our fans. And uh, so mm. I'm just excited to actually get to, you know, work back and forth with the crowd and be in front of humans. In person. <laughs> in person. It's going to be great. And then show them what this guy's got right here. I know. Yep. <laughs> I, don't, I think this is not blaming show. On that. That's what I've said. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. The Tay Tay show. Uh, so hopefully... We do some more dates this year after this show we haven't put anything on the calendar we've been offered to do a 30 day tour with another artist probably won't happen the problem is we homeschool and our kids we do huh yeah we have four kids we homeschool by we i mean she does the work <laughs> and uh it's really uprooting for kids to go away for long periods of time so we'll probably be doing small pockets of shows and select shows here and there yeah uh, um and bring the kids with us without taking them away from their friends and their take them away their, from their social friends. activities for too long and their theater yeah, very exciting news. All awesome. right, so at this point, I'm going to kick the band out. <laughs> <laughs> They're released. <laughs> They're released. No, I tortured them to make them do this, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> They're good sports. Thanks, Thank David. All right. Fast. Good to see you so guys. David Looking forward to, man, to know, two weeks. Oh, he, he just did the God's Dog video for the Kickstarter. So oh, nice. He does a lot of multi, lots of things. If you're looking for video work, I'm just over here selling David's wares. Uh, video work or, or film scoring, he's incredible. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, wow. You guys are making films. Find me on MySpace. Find him on MySpace. He says, <laughs> uh, uh, we'll, "We'll link to him somewhere." Um, okay, so here we are. What are we talking about? Are we talking about the record? We're oh my gosh, yeah. So it's not just the live performance, but you guys have a record coming out. Like, what's going on there? Yep. What can we expect there? February 29th. Derek, February 29th. Leap so the, the CD release, do we still call it that? No. What do we call it? Well, it's Premier, just a world set. premiere. <laughs> is at the show. So. Oh, That's awesome. Happening. Okay. And I saw yeah. also that uh, on iTunes, the pre release is out. So iTunes used to dominate back in the day for us, but Spotify came in. Um, you know, Pandora used to be a big station for us. Those things fell way down. So now the top is is Spotify, YouTube Music, and Amazon. And then fourth is iTunes. But iTunes is pretty cool in the sense that uh, when uh, people probably understand this already, but like when you stream a song, it pays the artist like 0.003 to 0.005 cents per stream. So to uh oh, oh he started screen sharing. Yeah, I'm sure my oh, screen here. It. Uh, hey, there it is. There we go. Um, so oh, Apple anyway, Music? what happens Not is, iTunes? I don't know. Behind yeah, the best thing, because people, people ask this all the time. They're like, hey, what's the best way to buy the music to support you guys? And I really want people to buy it wherever they're comfortable. But if you have iTunes, you probably have an iPhone. Uh, the best way for us to, you know, to help us out is to actually sure. pay to for the digital record. And as a reward to you, you get a song earlier, the song Holy Roller. It's a yeah, banger. It hits. Cool. It hits. High energy. Some high energy early. It's a pretty me. wild uh, record that you created there, Neil. Oh, thank you. Um, it's lots of guitar. It's a guitar Yeah, centric. there's a lot of guitar on the record. Mm -hmm. You can see the uh, art, cover art by James Flames. Yeah. What's so hilarious is that AI has become so prolific everywhere that everybody has assumed everything's AI all the time. So I just posted the art. And they're like, I wish you would quit using AI. And I was like, this is... This, like, is real, guys. this is the real person who made this for us and took a lot of time to do it. Ooh, they didn't so pick their like accusation. Zero AI in their cover. Jeez. Yeah. So James is awesome, but he really likes the kind of color palette that fit the record. So it was a no-brander to work with him, mm -hmm. uh, James Flames. So we and he's done a lot, uh, quite a few uh, band posters for like big bands. Right? Yeah. So Foo Fighters, Way bigger than us. Grateful Dead, I think. Um, Dave Matthews Band, his Ooh. hippie kind of poster art, he does that. 
Um, but he's, you know, we, we connected through Jonathan Peugeot, uh, James and I. And so we've been working mm -hmm. on this. So when the record comes out. In, Everyone connects through Jonathan Peugeot. Yeah. That's he's like Kevin Bacon. He's there for, <laughs> how many degrees of separation Seven you are from degrees. Jonathan Peugeot. Yeah. Jonathan Peugeot. Uh, so <laughs> there's, uh, there's going to be a Kickstarter at, towards the end of March where we kickstart the vinyl. We're putting this record on a double vinyl. It's going to be a longer version. It's going to have a bonus track. And it's going to have all these memoirs like Dead Horse did of oh, kind of explaining yeah. some elements of the story or hearing from the characters in the midst of the story. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to happen on the record. And so we're probably going to put it on tape, too, and probably CD because people have asked. What? People have, hey. Yeah, well, tapes are awesome. And they're oh cheap. Oh, my and gosh. So, and Kickstarter, and make when, it a comeback. Yeah, and Kickstarter, when you have a bigger package you're selling, um, you know, the more stuff you throw in there, the happier people are. So the final element we're just looking at the cost and trying to nail it down right now is a graphic novel of the story. Um, is the other is one of the other part of the Kickstarters and a deck of cards that goes with it. It's a normal standard set of yeah. playing cards, except it has it has an option in the artwork to play these ex these other games into event new games. So we've got that, and that's all Firebird themed. Um, and a graphic novel. We've really wanted to do that since Raven Locks. Right? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's just. Yeah. It's just hard to make sense out of it because so there's such a small percentage of the population that's into graphic novels. So when you have a smaller audience as an independent band, you have to think about that you have that even smaller wedge of people that are going to hear about the graphic novel mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. So I feel like Kickstarter is a better way to do that. Um, people will become aware of the story who normally maybe even wouldn't get something like that and uh, can participate in it. We're going to get the best artists imaginable to work on it. Um, so we've got we've, imaginable. Um, well, for us, so mm -hmm. so uh, some of my friends, like James, is one of them. And they're, they're it's just hard to find people that can beat them at what they do. Um, the guy mm -hmm. who did the cover for us for Dead Horse, um, hey, there it is. Look at Dead Horse. So this is a double vinyl. So he did the cover for us. His name is Michael O'Hare. I, um, being a total flake, I admit omitted his name from the actual vinyl. Oh. And I, I apologize for this every time I bring it up. So sad. Uh, but Mike, you know, he, when I met him, he was doing Peter Parker Spider-Man for Marvel. So oh, um, I'm gonna, you know, lean on him a little bit. He's an old friend. For at least for some, some consulting on the on the story. So we're doing that, and hopefully, hopefully it works. You know, uh, you never know until you do it. But uh, I'd love to get all this stuff out to people that they ask for. It's just too big of an out of pocket pocket expense you know mm -hmm. with all the bills and four kids and in maintaining a studio and trying to keep this career going wow so well, i'm not saying that to complain I, people understand how independent art works i don't know is that kickstarter's you fun too being, you have to you have to support it so yeah. um it's really up to them so it's, it's a way to give people it's a way for people to decide and vote for what they want to come into existence in the world creatively. So right. I really like that model. Vote I with think, your money. I think that's better than a bunch of people trying to guess or force a certain thing down the public's throat through money and marketing. Mm -hmm. I, I like the I like the crowdfunded grassroots support because you have this direct eye contact with your audience, and you can really get a sense for the kinds of things that are moving you when you're making the music that you're excited about, and then what actually resonates with them. Mm -hmm. And it really is helpful for us because it really shows me, okay, here are the things you love to do, Neil, and here are the things that people respond to. So do those things mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to become something we're not to try to find some kind of popular audience. Uh, so yeah. I think Kickstarter just really fits our model of how we've done everything all along, which is trying to have eye contact with our audience and seeing what's moving them mm -hmm. and, and try to find the commonality between what moves us and what we're excited about. Yeah, absolutely. And plus, the Kickstarter offers an, an opportunity to be part of the experience, you know, from the get go. And so, yeah, looking forward to that. Do you have a date on that? Is it going to be this year? The Kickstarter? No, not yet. I got to we've got to put the whole thing together. So we've been working so hard that after the conference and the show um, and the March, I'm going to take a week off and just and just stare at the ceiling and uh, break. <laughs> and Kate and I'll go out for a couple of dinners and then I'm going to get back to work on the Kickstarter. So I imagine it's only going to take us a couple of weeks to put all the, the data together okay. and the tears. So, um, so probably the end of March. Yeah. It's a good way to kick off great Lent. If you're Orthodox, there you just, go. By yeah. supporting a starving artist. Yeah. Dreams and goals. Even more starving during Lent. Yeah. yeah, yeah we starve starving artists. <laughs> Derek, right. I'm having like deja vu. I think the last time I was on a call with you was like when we were in the Keys on our crazy COVID Florida trip. Maybe you're like right. I think we. Ago, I think that was one of the ago. first times yeah. I had uh, Derek had a song. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Airbnb. Yeah. I believe it was. Yeah. 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 Yep. And here you are, based out of yep. Florida, 
And now I get to fly over from, yes. I don't know, the other side of the country, edge of the world, California, <laughs> to visit you in Florida. Okay, I mean, so what... you're coming in. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, well, you're coming into the summit, so you're flying in. We're actually, uh, don't tell the Airbnb, pe Airbnb people, but we're going to let Derek uh, sneak into the place and nice. maybe, maybe exceed the maximum capacity. Exceed our maximum capacity. <laughs> no, I think you're right at it right now, actually. So. Yeah, our kids were like, we have to share rooms. Like, yeah. With themselves. Yeah, they want okay. their own rooms. Yes. I'm like, no, you're, we're going to pack yeah. you all in the room with the bunk beds. You'll be all right. So that yeah. Derek can have a couch. Or I'll be bunking. Um, totally. It'll be great. Yeah, so you're coming down. What do you, what do you, have you looked at the schedule for the conference? I want to see what you're excited about or what you're going to be looking forward to oh, besides man. me. You just had to ask me. I'm, I'm on the fence because uh, there's like, we have to pick a track, right? Well, here, I'll go ahead and yeah. share screen again. I so we have, have to pick to... a track and maybe you could help me out with this. Maybe we could narrow this down because there's certain ones that I really want to do. So if you haven't seen it yet, I just shared screen. We're looking at the symbolic world and we have here we go. We have logocentric art, universal history. And that's Jonathan and I, yeah. Okay. And then her. And then on day two, that is gonna be Vesper Samper and Martin uh Shaw. Oh, well, that's exciting. But that's a different path you can select differently, even though it's part of the same thread. So which what one is Vesper on? So logocentric art on Friday of the conference, which is the second day, is gonna be myself and Jonathan Pichot. Yeah. Um yeah. and then on day the third day where you can pick a path again, there is a logo centric art path available and that'll be Vesper Stamper and Martin Shaw sharing that can session. Can you pick a different path every day or is it the same throughout? No, you can pick a different, every day you get to pick a different path. Oh, but really? the good news is Derek, I guess I, I, you probably know this, but nobody really misses out. It's just a matter of what you want to see in person mm -hmm. because in the end, there's going to be an online version of, available to everyone that attends the conference. I'm really torn because, of course, I want to um, like support my husband, but it's also like I live with you and I hear about this stuff like every day. So, oh my gosh, my heart is broken, Derek. What do I do? What do I do? She's basically breaking up with. Oh, uh, man. Podcast. No, she's being strategic, you know, divide and yeah. conquer. <laughs> yeah. Fronts. So, uh, this is it is a problem because I was talking with Richard about this. He wants to come to my path when he's talking and I want to go to his. Yeah. What he do wants you to come see Jonathan. I well, because I told him, well, I'm kind of keeping a secret of what we're talking about um, a little bit. I probably should let a little more out there if I want to get people to come to our path. Probably. But um, so, and then on the third day, I mean, the third day of the conference, the other path is this hearth and hospitality is listed as. And so I think it's being advertised. It might slightly change, but it's Nicholas Gotar. And it's the content of the speech he gave is something similar to how to survive a Russian fairy tale, which is really rad. Ah, um, so his good. path's going to be great. Uh, well, we yeah. kind of got a little taste of that in the Keys, right? When we were doing our super, uh, our weird Russian feasting. Yes. So. Yeah, it was really great. So one of the things that's going to happen here has already happened. So when we started talking with this, the speakers amongst ourselves, everybody's path turned into something more esoteric and a deeper and deeper dive because they're <laughs> like, okay, this is the core audience. These are the people that are going to get this symbolism. So yeah. I think that, you know, Father Stephen DeYoung on the Universal History Path or no, exactly. It, he's got a deep dive there yeah and richard's got a he's going to be doing a deep dive there but even just so on friday morning i think uh father stephen de young speaks and he's talking about like uh nietzsche's guide to bodily resurrection and it's through the lens of dante's inferno but nietzsche it, uh, yeah, it takes the place of um oh what's his face um, I don't even know. I don't, I don't want to spoil it for him, but it's wild. So once he started announcing and people started going back and forth, everything just turned into like this, like, oh, how how deep of a dive can you, you go into? How strange of a point can you bring back home? So I think it's going to be pretty wild. I think there's it's going to be a collection of things you're going to hear from the speakers, you know, regardless of which path you take that is uh, not standard YouTube content. I'm a, I know this is like below his pay scale, but I'm excited about Richard because I want him to write like a universal history curriculum for homeschool. For homeschool. Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been on him a couple of years for that. I'm like, man, I like, I need, I need your curriculum because I oh, feel man. like I'm kind of doing silly stuff with history over here. I mean, you would use that, wouldn't you, Derek? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Probably what, like ninth grade, 10th grade? Perfect. Yeah, it'd yeah. be high school for sure, but I would still make my uh, middle and lower school yeah. kids listen to. It That's would be how fine. Homeschool, but they yeah, overlap, so I'm, you know, uh, little mentorship program. Yeah. I'm kind of an underdog person too, though. So if somebody's got like 20 people, I might have to just join that one. 
I think they'll be pretty even. I think that the reason they're going to be pretty even is because the two room, the room splits in half. So if everybody decided to go to one side, there's going to be a cap on the number of people that can take that path. So they have no choice. But I mean, really, again, it's nobody misses out. It's just a matter if you want to hopefully shoot a question out for question and answer in person. Mm -hmm. But everybody gets access to the content afterwards. Gotcha. Um, so I think they're announcing it. Um, I think they're announcing it now because the tickets are almost completely gone. I mean, That's you can great. you can still get some. Good news. Um, they're still they're mostly sold, but I think there's still some spots left. No VIPs left, um, mm -hmm. but there's they're going to announce that they're going to sell the virtual tickets to the general public. All the comments have been like, hey, can't afford to come, can't make it in time, can't get off work. Please tell me there's going to be a virtual version of this online. The virtual version, I think, is going to air a couple of months afterwards. But Are you going to sell that? Yeah, I think it's going up now because I think there's going to be a discount for people who buy. Oh, Keep Just follow great. Jonathan on Twitter and keep an eye out for it because there's going to be a discount for people to buy the virtual ticket before the summit starts. Um, yeah. So, and then there's surprise guests. There's, there's some su surprise Ooh. guests Ooh. where if you had told people they were going to be there, the conference probably would have sold out in four seconds, but mm -hmm. they're surprises, you know? So we wanted to make sure it was open to all of the, the hardcore Jonathan Peugeot symbolic world followers first. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it's going to be an interesting roster of people uh, mingling around at the conference. You'll be surprised. Yeah. Well, even the speakers are really excited to hang out with each other, right? Oh, yeah. We're, like some of these people are just starting to get to know each other and be friends. So it's like a orthodox Avengers team for me. Yeah. yeah, in a way. <laughs> I like to say it like Muppets. You know, I think the Muppets is a little more modest. And <laughs> Avengers, you know, it's Muppets. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I like it. And yeah, so, so I mean, okay, Florida. Hey, it's my first time going to Florida. So like, I mean, what? what what do I do? Do I even bring pants? I mean, do I just bring flip flops and you know some shorts? I mean, up to you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so it's. I think it's gonna. It's probably gonna be similar to California weather that time of year. It's gonna. It, it looking like the seventies. Comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, it's gonna be the seventies. Florida could it rain. It's very casual. It could be eighty-five. Could be fifty-five. You don't mm -hmm. know. Um, right now it looks like it's going to be in the seventies, but that's fickle in Florida. So yeah, um, everything's pretty close together in Tarpon, like walking distance. So, uh, you know, if you're in a group and one person rents a car, that'll be fine. It's an adorable little town. It's a very Greek, uh, the food, all the Greeks settled there awesome. because they uh, excelled at sponge diving back in the day. So <laughs> It is uh, uh, the capital of America. Sponge Springs. capital of America and incredible Greek food. So Man, can't miss I it. Love, really fun. I, yeah, I love symbolically that it's happening on leap year. Um, I think that's fun. I think that it's it's a good it's it's prior to most school breaks too. So people hang around town and want to go to like Disney World or Bush Gardens in Tampa, which is closer. Mm. Disney World's not far, it's like an hour and twenty minutes from there. Or I would suggest Universal over Disney World if you're an adult. Um because it's it's just I I, I think it's superior. Or everybody now. can just come over to Daytona and hang out with us. Yep. And I, we don't. I don't like giving Disney my number. I get the sense they don't like me or my band. So mm. um. <laughs> I think that's apparent based on like the last two or three podcasts we had. You're all but trashing Disney, Star Wars. Oh yeah, Disney every time and... it comes up. Yeah, I still haven't seen uh, Andor though. Yeah. Someday you know, soon. I there. I I think you you won that one. I let go of my Disney subscription. I I didn't renew it. I'm I'm pretty much done. Oh, I was gonna say you wow. can send me your login wow. and I can so watch sad. Andor. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it won't hey, won't be for you, mine. You have like to get it from reason. someone else. Although they are gonna come out with an Andor season two, but it's like, I don't know. I, I drew the line in the sand. Made my choice. Oh yeah, no. Kate was saying that. Yeah. Well, I grew up. I grew up going to Disney at least once a year with my parents, Whoa. and we lived in Kentucky, so oh. it's not not like we lived here. And right uh, and we kind of continued that on when Neil and I got together. And and started having kids we'd take them almost every year yeah um, we have like the haunted mansion like paintings in our kitchen you know like we're, we're pretty big disney people. but it was like it was every time every year we went it was like there was something a little worse and a little worse and the experience just felt more and more like they're just milking you every corner and things yeah. that used to be free became charged and they were worse versions so by the time we went there we went there in 2020 and it was during like the mask time and it was so dystopian because the they were, they were like, hey, we're only letting 25% of the capacity in. Those parks were packed. And mm. all they did the whole time is like yell at you over the loudspeaker about <laughs> social distancing. 
things and, ma and masking. It was very disturbing. And it, it, they were threatening. They weren't just like, they, they had this friendly voice, but then they were basically explaining the, 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 how they would remove you from the park as part of the message. And, and it weird. got like, it, it became like this threat and it was like a bribe, but if you behave, you get to stay. Oh. So it was like this, yeah, it was like blackmail and a bribe at the same time going to Disney World. And after that, I was kind of like, I don't know if it's worth it. Let's let maybe yeah. someone else will buy the company one day and run it better. Uh, but it, it the magic would yeah. slip away every time we'd go. Yeah. But we just feel like we need to like break out into song. Like it's like we're in a yeah. music video for one of our dystopian. Yeah, music. it really was. Future uh, songs or something. Whoa. So okay. So yeah, it's Mary Poppins style. Record. <laughs> yeah. Dirt, future Dirt Poor Robbins record that takes place in, inside of a defunct, uh, dystopian, haunted theme park. Yeah. Okay, no, people would blame you like, that it was AI driven. Sorry. You, you didn't you have an idea to go and like shoot a music video in Disney, kind of like without under the radar? Knowing. Yeah, but then they, uh, you ever seen the movie Tomorrowland? I don't think I have. Uh, Derek, no, what's up? It's this. It's a film that people shot in Disney World without Disney's permission, and it's oh. this kind of surrealist, impressionistic. It's very cool. Um, the guy <laughs> basically it has. It's kind of yeah. The guys, it's a strange story, but it was a neat idea for a film. But they were counting on the fact that Disney was going to try to sue him or something like that, so they'd get all this free publicity. But Disney like smartened up and like just let it slide, and nobody saw the movie because wow. there was no controversy. Disney didn't fight it at all, um, and that was the end of it. Wow, wow. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, Firebird, Derek, Firebird. Tell um, me about the album. Yeah, because last yeah. time we talked, you were just about to come out with the EP, four tracks, um, which mm -hmm. included "Beauty Will Save the World." Uh, amongst others and then as i was looking through the list i see those four but the order's a little bit different and now you've you bumped it up to 12 so tell us yes. about the full album okay so after the ep version we released two singles um i like this i like releasing singles um i think i might do more of that in, in the future i know that people like to get chunks of music at a time the problem is the all of the distribution digital distribution methods prefer that you release one song at a time. Well, I don't even know if they prefer it, but they reward you for doing it. So that's mm -hmm. why I would assume they prefer it. So it's easier. So like, for example, on Spotify, um, one of the things that helps an, uh, uh, a smaller artist like us is getting added to one of their editorial playlists. And so they'll let you pitch them one song from every release for an editorial playlist. But if you do a single, they let you do that as well. So for us in our popularity level, we always get on editorial playlists. But so when I release six songs at a time, like I'm doing on the next record, six new songs, um, we're actually throwing away the free marketing on five songs that we would get on a lot of these platforms Yay. with the editorial playlists. But at the same time, there's when the full album comes out, people want that reveal moment. They don't want it to be like, oh, there's just one extra song I'm waiting on. So I, I didn't feel right about sticking with that plan so we're releasing six new songs all at the same time with the full record now what's the, the really get pros the and the cons story. of releasing all of uh, the songs at once yeah all the songs at once is uh it's a fan friendly tactic it's not good for any of our social channels or whatnot because they want fresh new content all the time they want reasons for people to come back and check in are you talking about like the uh, the story behind the record at all some point well the uh, graphic novel obviously the story is okay, going to so come you're out not giving it away yet. yeah so um we really enjoyed the process of having the full story known to the public of queen of the night but i don't think queen of the night is so it's not the story is not so transparent to people that they even really know what it means all the way mm -hmm. uh so it still preserves some sort of mystery firebird is going to play in the same way the story in the story we're going back to the dead horse universe that we released that record um in 2019 and in, in 2020 uh, we're going back to that universe and we're feeling it's not a prequel. It's not a sequel. It's a midquill. <laughs> mid mid midquill? Midquill? Yes. <laughs> I like so it. So there's all these th sounds like a cough syrup. So in the in the <laughs> Dead Horse story, we have kind of this Rip Van Winkle pattern that happens where uh, um, you know, so when Rip Van Winkle, what's really neat about the story is that Rip Van Winkle lives in um a colonial America that is still controlled by the king of England. Yeah, uh, he falls asleep and wakes up a hundred years, almost a hundred years later. Hmm. And now America is independent democratic society. So there's this wonderful device in that story of you, you can see a place and you know a place in his current trajectory. And you can kind of anachronistically compare those two things by having these jumps in time where a character, you know, goes into cybernetic sleep or whatever they call that, uh, you know, uh, 
hibernate hibernation um that kind of sleep or something like rip van winkle or some kind of magic spell that these little dutch you know alcohol makers uh <laughs> play on him <laughs> so the dead horse story it's like an evaluation of what things were like in the 1970s with energy and oil and electricity and what that progressed to in this in 2077 100 years later with this ai that was embodied and uh was supposed to solve this disconnected problem that people were having it was supposed to go along with forwarding this moral therapeutic desire for you to be validated and so you had your own personal validation engine in the mm. in these robots A validation uh, called the saints and, interesting yes and so in 2077 we can see like how the mistakes we've made in exploiting technology and energy could come to an apocalyptic ending but it's not a complete ending of the story. So the characters fall back to sleep to see what, what happens to the world in a thousand years later in 3077. So this story happens after 2077 and before 3077. And it's a world mm -hmm. where um, AI still has a role, but a, a different role. And the state that people live in is more of what you call a pink police state in the sense where um, everything's a bribe. So, hey, like, we want you to live a certain way, but we'll give you this awesome thing you want. Like we'll give you your indulgences. We'll give you your things that uh, keep you happy. We'll give you your drugs. Everything becomes a drug exchange between a drug dealer and the government. Mm -hmm. um, and there is still that if you step too far out of line or you or you wise up, you're in trouble. Uh, so that's part of what's happening in the Dead Horse story. But we're actually telling a story that happened in the fourth century um, in this that happened in the real world, which is the story of St. Uh, Profarios, the mime. Hmm. Um, who under a pagan emperor uh, decided to mock a baptism and something really wonderful happens in the story. So how I, I guess the way I, I would describe it to people, if I was going to um, em embellish the details or, or try to suck you into the story more would be that he decides to baptize himself. He gets a hold of this service and he thinks that they all think this is hilarious, what Christians are doing in baptizing uh, people. So he decides to baptize himself in front of something, in front of, from an audience for humor, just it's like this thing, like, so this happens with flat earth sometimes. So like, if I look at the flat earth, it's hard, almost impossible to tell the difference between the serious content creators and someone who's parodying it because it's so, mm -hmm. such an extreme position right. that you can't like, it's the, when I listen to someone who's being serious, I think they're joking. And when I listen to someone who's joking, I think they're being serious. So it's, it's so far away from the standard um, thinking that it becomes, uh, it becomes the parody and the real thing become the same. Mm -hmm. So this happens in the story of St. Profarius where um, the parody of the baptism becomes a real baptism. And when he goes under the water, he dunks himself under the water. Hmm. Who knows what he saw down there? Like he's like, there's he, cause he does not come back up out of the water, the same person, mm -hmm. whatever he sees in that moment, who knows if it, if it comes to him like a dream, like, you know how you, you're supposed to dream mm -hmm. in seven to 10 seconds and you have a whole story or a whole life in your dreams. Some, Something like that seems to happen because he comes back up and he's absolutely convinced the thing he was just mocking is is the best explanation mm -hmm. for reality and love and hope wow. and all of these things. So um, there's a moment like that in our story. So there's this the it's a moment where it looks like all the good has left the world and this this menacing AI has enslaved humanity under their own pleasures mm -hmm. and uh the good, the real reason, the 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 purpose of life comes flooding back into the world um, through a surprise mockery, if you wow. will. So wow. that's the story. Where that's the story. Which you know, I didn't really actually give much away, even though it sounds like that's kind of the whole plot line. Because um, mm -hmm. I think there's, you know, so like Shakespeare used to use things like he used to use anachronistic content, like throwing a a wristwatch into Julius Caesar or something like that, where mm -hmm. it. It, it does this thing where it grabs your attention right away. You're like, there's like, that's historically inaccurate, Shakespeare. What are you doing? I don't know if it was Julius Caesar he did this in, but he did this a few times where he threw in modern technology into the old stories. And it has a wonderful thing of connecting the past and the present. It, it, the, the object holds more weight because you can see, it helps you understand that those people are like you. Or something like when you see a Latin phrase on the side of a building, you know, it normally has a lot of weight if you know what it means. It, it seems to have more gravitas because... It Robitas. is an old expression that meant something to people at the time that means something profound to us now and, and has a way of connecting us to the past and the present. So in these stories, it's actually the opposite. We're talking about a future catastrophe and we're connecting it to the errors we're making now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it's apocalyptic in the sense that it's hopefully unveiling um, the consequences of our own 
actions and patterns that we're ignoring in our every, everyday life mm, that we're participating. Yeah. I'm wondering how does the, how does the theme of like the psychedelic and AI, like what, how, how can we understand psychedelic? Cause usually when, when I hear that, I think of, you know, substance, mushrooms, trips, like multi-technical color type of display visions yep. and things like that. But the way you're describing, it seems like uh, there's something more profound happening. Yeah. So there's, okay. So think about it this way. Um, when, when we think about the way that even psychedelics are being talked about now, like there's this, there's murmuring of, of it, of its medical help, that it, it creates these profound experiences and people come out of it. Like, let's say some, I saw some kind of stat where it was like 80% of the time we give people, psil, whatever, which one it was, psilocybin or mm -hmm. uh, that like, you know, names we can, we can use it to cure smoking addiction. Like some, like 80% of the people that do it come out and they'll never even right. want to pick up a cigarette again. So there's some kind of radical transformation that people, um, are seeing these psychedelics. Now, I think that psychedelics falls into the category of, of, um, unearned knowledge, for example, if, so the, the, one of the problems is if someone just gives, like, if I'm in an algebra class and I want to answer the question, if the teacher doesn't teach me the process of coming to the conclusion myself, just gives me the answer. I'm like, Oh, I got the answer, right. Right. There's a certain kind of pride that comes with this knowledge, but the mm -hmm. bridge between the answer and the question, mm -hmm. it, wasn't handed to me. It was, it, it remained in the teacher's possession. So there is something mm -hmm. I notice when I, when I talk to people that have used psychedelics and feel like they gained some kind of insight, there's a disconnectedness between any kind of actual worldly or embodied discipline that they could take on themselves and be able to walk into that sort of revelation or space mm -hmm. on their own. So it's, it's totally reliant almost on like a pharmaceutical technological bridge that's built for them to gain mm -hmm. insight. So, mm -hmm. um, and generally, those insights are not properly connected back to um, correct philosophy in the real world. So that's one of the problems you see in psychedelics. People are very naive to this. We don't have a lot of respect for, uh, let's say, in the ancient world where they might not have built or used something like this out of fear of offending the gods. People like, oh, this is all vacated. So whatever we can use to create power in the world, we do. So there's this problem that people aren't seeing yet with psychedelics is that these are going to be used against the population at some point. Mm -hmm. um, um, so in our story, this isn't too much of a giveaway, but the ruling class wants to present themselves as divine to the lower class. So the lower class is constantly being mm -hmm. microdosed without, uh, without their knowledge in a very controlled way so that when these leaders appear, they have a divine transcendent experience. Uh -huh. And so they're being so like, it's not just that these are the people that give us all our good things, our little pleasures we like and keep us fed. And, and, and as long as we work for them and are, are obedient to them and venerate them, we get these things. It's not just that, is that they're actually going to have an embodied experience where they think they're, mm -hmm. they're, they have the chance to touch the transcendent through them, that they're actually of a higher ontological order than they are. And psychedelics are being used to create this sort of uh, veneration of the leadership so that people are more willfully compliant out of fear for offending the divine. Mm. Quick question. So, um, yes. So if I were to take a guess, I would say that your DJ is going to be playing the ruling class demigods. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? So he is his, for his, his own good. decision. For his own decision. Well, I mean, there's we didn't a, come up with that costume. You know, you guess something <laughs> a little too close to the story, and I don't want to give it away because it is one of the elements I'd like to be a surprise in the um, um, in the graphic novel. But I like your intuition on that idea that there is uh, that there is a way to represent that mm -hmm. through a man in a disco ball suit. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> with, with divine lighting around it. Um, divine disco yes. ball accident. Yeah. yeah. Well, so one of the bands that my dad and I uh, share that we really enjoy, I feel like I was kind of born, like I should have been born in his time and we could have been put, uh, pals just going to the concert for uh, the first generation of Genesis, progressive rock band Genesis with Peter Gabriel. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so... But one thing I just loved, if you look at like their their performances of Supper's Ready or something, there's like costume changes. There's all of these you know of course like the, the yeah like the lights are going but they also have kind of like this shakespearean stage prop going on too where there's like actual like cut like cutouts and things and like there's physical things like you're almost like on a theater stage um 
So I'm just, I'm just curious, like, is, is that some type of thing that you like to incorporate? Do you have, you know, costumes as, as part of the performance? We've done it before. Oh. Yeah. We have outfits we wouldn't necessarily wear to the I did coffee have, shop. Yeah, I had a costume change in one of our shows. Oh, yeah. So that was we the... We try to keep it simple, but we end up losing money pretty much every time we do live shows because yeah. we bring so many elements into it that it's, yeah, a little over the top. But I love that. I mean, you're, yeah, you're speaking my language there because I was a theater kid growing up. So, oh. so we did a show at Cast of Mary Poppins. And, um, you know, so Kate comes in in the beginning, um, flying in on an umbrella in oh. Mary Poppins, like put up with her hair up outfit. And I, it was fun. myself, I'm dressed as a chimney sweep who's just come out of a dirty chimney. So I look like, you know, kind of Victorian post-apocalyptic. But we were on a budget. So it was actually funny. It, I didn't have like flying rig or anything. I was actually like pushed in on like a giant like cart. Well, a cart like a that was below cart. the level of the crowd. So they couldn't They're see it. They're just kind of trying to like, balance yes. my umbrella. It actually worked. The pictures are great. Yeah, um, but we did that whole set. And then at one point we changed into the super califragilistic outfits and we ended up doing performing spoonful of sugar live. You can search oh. that on YouTube right now. Yeah. You know what? That's my, uh, my wife's favorite, uh, favorite oh, video no, that you song. guys did. Oh, the whole song. That's right. Oh, that. Yeah. The okay. video didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. That was fun. Oh, you, so you've heard this. You've heard this. Derek. Yes. So when, uh, when I was looking up for our very first conversation, we were looking up, you know, YouTube channel and the like, uh, and my my wife was right there and she is a musical person. I mean, she knows all of the old musicals by heart. She'll just yeah. be going awesome. about the house and just be singing word for word, sound of music, you know, Mary Poppins and sure. the like. And so when she saw that, she's like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. You know, <laughs> and then she's like, she was trying to look for like, where's more of their live performances? And I tried to explain, I was like, like well, you know, this is what they're doing. Um, and right. so I think I'm, um, She's a little bit jealous that she can't join me this time because of, of the things Next that you time. guys do. That's one of her favorite things. Tell her she will be missed. Well, Airbnb a bigger house next time, Derek, for you. Yeah, and well, what I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to invest in like rigging up a minivan and we're just going to road trip it and do homeschooling on the road. Awesome. That'd be sweet. Um, yeah, world schooling. World school, um, that's right. Yeah, so the... Oh, wow. um, so Mary Poppins, you Mary Poppins, that had costume changes. We did um, Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, we used one of our children because Kate um, shrinks down at the end. But we yeah, used one I of drink our like the blonde-haired children. And then I like disappear and uh, yeah. uh, our oldest story came out like little Alice. So cute. Yeah, oh, so we did that perfect. and then we had all... We did a... Uh, we had a brass Edgar section. That, we, no, we had a brass section that came out as the playing cards that the Queen of Hearts has. Oh, yeah, that was so cool. they came marching out for the finale yes. and... It, awesome. Those were fun shows. So we always try to do something like that. Um, Have you considered doing expensive. anything for Queen of the Night? Because that was like a whole family project. I have a I have a little bit of a bucket list uh, hope there that we could maybe do that with like a small uh, ensemble, like a little cool. orchestra live. But yeah. so you show the you show the movie, you know, and then we score it live. Oh, um, yeah. would be really fun. Yeah, because I mean, you guys already I have a lot so of the props. Right? I mean, you could. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, no, so that would be, so I've done this actually participating in this before scoring a movie live, and that was a lot of fun. It's a tremendous amount of work, and it's a real tight row back in the sense of there's no do-overs if you get off time with the film and <laughs> and things like that. So it takes a, a tremendous amount of over-rehearsal, you could mm -hmm. say. I guess the appropriate amount of rehearsal for something like that is is to overdo it. Um, One so, day, though. Yeah, so that would be yeah. fun. Um We'll see what happens with this, uh, you know, what, what the shows are going to develop into this year. So we're doing a little experiment um, in this kind of set on the symbolic world. We feel real confident about the direction and the guests we're making. But um, we'll after the conference, we'll come back and we'll evaluate, hey, what are we going to do next time? What will we do differently? What worked? What could we double down on? You know, that kind of conversation we have. We're not. Um, yeah, we're always trying to figure out if there's a better way to bake a cake. We want to. Mm -hmm. use that way. and should we actually do some touring which as you just brought up it's just kind of like what do we do with our children so we're trying to figure out how to make that yeah. work yeah without it, uprooting their world. part of the problem is we have too many ideas so i've already got like <laughs> already got like the next two ideas going you know and there were 20 ideas that i narrowed it down to my two favorite and so i'm excited so as soon as i get back from this conference i want to start working on the next record and the next story and the next film and um but at the same time it's sort of like people keep requesting they want to see us in person they want us to come out mm -hmm. but so i have this problem of of like well i would like to do that too 
but I also want to get these ideas done because more are going to come and then I'm going to, they're going to start, you know, stockpiling in my brain. Yeah. And so the, every moment I spend on the road is a moment I'm not forwarding new ideas. So it just depends on what you really want in the end from the audience. We can just do a greatest, they want more more music or do they want to see this in person? We'll do a greatest hits tour when we're like in our 60s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm just thinking too, we're going to the Symbolic World Summit. Like what better place to have props in your show than a Symbolic World? Like it, it's almost like a requirement. Now. Right. Oh yeah, saying. no. Listen, I'm all, I'm all for no, it. Nested Easter egg like, symbolism this, is just that. It's like, don't do that. Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm the one that's always trying to sneak in the uh, theatrical uh -huh. elements. Right, you are. It, uh, I mean, we love it. We love it. We we both grew up doing musical theater, and um, and really like that that whole the the actual work. If you're in a, ever in a musical theater show. The actual rehearsals and work are a big part of the reward. Once it comes down to actually it's doing the, the show part. over and over again, it's not as much fun as being there with friends and perfecting the show for me. So we really do. Ooh, no, I like both sides. Of we it. really like, we're like carny mm -hmm. folk though, that we enjoy all those aspects, putting the costumes together, making the props, rehearsal, um, the choreography it's of it. It's really fun. Like this has been really fun bringing in some other musicians with us. Cause it's just Neil and I normally just doing what we do, but um, you know, you really get a uh, bit by the bug when you're in a musical of that, like, none of this will work unless we're all doing our part. So it's that like, you know, we're better together kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really kind of thrive off of that. I love that. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, I mean, really, what what's odd, odd enough. So this is going to be weird for some people because, again, most of the people follow us don't know us probably don't even know our names know the band name or it's just on a playlist or they happen to find more things eventually they they work their way in and they come and tell you on social media that they've been listening or something like that so but there's a lot of people because we don't really make a lot of music videos there's been very few things we appear in they don't know us they don't know anything about us so there are things that are about us if you move into our closer circles you're going to learn like you're going to learn about our faith a little bit because it's it's you know if you, especially if you follow our personal pages and stuff like that um you're going to learn about, you know, how we were making the music, you know, what we're up to with our time. Uh, and then the meaning behind the most people want to know the meaning behind things. Uh, people can detect that there's it's, this is coming from a deeper river than potentially some of the super more superficial elements of pop culture. Um, so they want to know they want answers. Uh, but the reality is, is that one of the things that's always surprising to certain people um, is that we're Christians. It's like so because. I don't, we don't leave with that information because it depends on the interview and the time you have, because that I say that out loud to a general audience. It does what, what appears in their head is not what appears in my life. Right. So their image of that generally could be something more like what appears on a billboard or um, in an evangelical church or, something different or a televangelist person. or maybe a Christian they know in their life, who's a little more of a Bible thumper fundamentalist type. Like, I don't know what comes into their head. It's very rare that our tradition, like, you know, in Eastern Orthodoxy would be what is the first thought that someone thinks of. And they think of this, you know, rich, artistic, um, symbolic, um, almost appears like mythology to a modern person, mm -hmm. um, ancient version of Christianity. That doesn't come to their head. So it normally is not the type of content we lead with. I don't think it, it really is that relevant for someone to understand our worldview, to enjoy our music. Mm -hmm. I think it crosses all those barriers, but people are surprised because when they hear that, they they realize nothing we're doing sounds like Christian music or what they would think of in that capacity. Yeah. Even the art, the art doesn't seem to be specifically trying to send a message um, outside of what a normal folk artist like has always done. It's like, hey, look around, wake up. Like there's always this call in in things that are more grassroots ground level art where it's trying to wake you up to the problems that the king is causing it's probably it's trying to wake you up to the patterns that we're all dragging ourselves into hell with um in a very literal like now sense like how we're ruining the world right before us mm -hmm. and so those things appear in our music but i don't think i don't think we're really at any point really trying to fuse like a, an agenda and at the same time we we take on whatever stories come to us this story right here is it's going to have more of a Christian, historical Christian pattern in it because it's inspired by the life of a saint. Um, our next record, I'm not telling people what it's about yet, but it's it's actually, it's one of the most important Christian stories that no one's ever told. 
And the reason we selected it isn't because um, isn't because oh this it'll have this effect on the audience. Audience members will start voting this way. They'll go to this church, whatever. Like that's not coming to head. It's just the story is so freaking interesting and so overlooked that there it's it's this gold mine sitting in plain sight. It's like when someone comes along and names their band Muse, and you're like, how did someone not take that name? I know, right? I thought yeah. that. the next story we're doing is like how has nobody done this before? Mm. Like how, like literally this story is so huge and it, um, it's so revealing to what our lives are like. And, and, and even our own existential fear of the afterlife is in this story. Um, it's going to ruffle some feathers. I think. Well, I think it ruffles feathers anytime you bring this type of stuff up because people I'm okay. If someone's offended by what I really am, what's a, what's annoying is when mm. someone hears a label attached to you and they make all kinds of assumptions because Good this point. happens all the time. Like someone went through Derek, one of our old videos we had, and they were like kind of offended about some of the things we were talking about. And I started to dig in and this was a person who was really involved in politics and really involved in some strange circles where mm -hmm. like they were, they were mad. They were mad because I moved to Florida and they told me that, uh, <laughs> that Ron DeSantis was, was killing trans people. And I was like, okay, I understand you don't like his policies, but like, what kind of evidence do you have for that assertion? Like, I would love to see, um, like enlighten me to your, deduction and there was nothing it was you know it's, it was political so but this person in my in their head imagined that i was like going to be some person who would never be around them in real life and the, the reality is like listen i mm. if you're if you are resonating with the themes in our music we're going to get along fine in real life mm -hmm. like these weird immature political boundaries people have driven the idea that think that we have to totally line up in some kind of puritanical political religious way on everything or we're supposed to hate each other i don't live in that world like I, that is, I think that's 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 like such a regression for Maybe mankind. You kind of get along with everyone, actually. To, well, it's yeah. a, you in the same way. Um, it's such a regression for mankind to try to fall back into this politicized thing where if you don't, oh my gosh, you would vote that way on this issue. Like, never mm -hmm. mind you. Mm -hmm. And if people don't realize how puritanical that is and how much it is an attempt to control other people's behavior through your disapproval and your shame, uh, they would realize that all the things that had to do with religion that they've been criticized for years, they've did, dove head first into an even a more ludicrous way through politics. I had a question. Uh, so we're talking about how your guys' music is actually pretty refreshing because it's not political. But then the first song of the new Firebird album is entitled Political. So maybe you could just explain that a little bit. Yeah, so it's it's not the kind of, it's not taking a side in politics, right? It's, it's more talking about um, if one perspective gains too much political power, what happens? And that is that when the world moves towards becoming more political, now everything you encounter is a bribe and blackmail at the same time. Mm -hmm. If you're paying attention, mm -hmm. you're being blackmailed against doing the wrong thing and that potentially being held up against you. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you're being enticed over to their camp because they have some kind of thing they're promising you they're going to deliver. But mm -hmm. if you start to, I mean, if you live as long as we have, which isn't that long, you start to realize that in politics, all these promises are empty, that the government has no ability to redeem your life. So we think a much better path for people is, is to be concerned about what they what's right in front of them not that nobody should get involved in politics, is that, you know, people get all this stress about things they can't change, they can't control, and they get all this news that has nothing to do with their direct lives where their feet are all the time. And they end up frustrated in an eternal state of anxiety and otherizing and, and anger with people. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you're carrying this into the home with the people you love, into your friendships, you're carrying this anxiety and stress um, about something you can't change. And it's really affecting and hurting the things that people can change the way they can experience love mm -hmm. and faith and hope in their own lives. So we're always, yeah. our, our encouragement is always like, I see the path of the future and not through some sort of political redemption or change that's going to save everything. Not that politics means nothing, but for the average person, if they saw their role in, in, in saving the world by loving their neighbor, being good to the people that are actually in their lives, um, they would find that they're they were way more effective and and could actually see the purpose of, in their own existence a lot clearer than to get distracted by all of these external rumors and uh, half truths and mm -hmm. uh, which is true pressures. Uh, true of Jesus time too right like oh, they yeah. wanted him to come in and be a political leader be a political yes. leader that's a great point Kate right. well and done he refused. She got it's not it. what he was here for. That's the right answer. Yeah. That song, though, is really fun. I, I'm really enjoying um, 
practicing that one to perform. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of wish I could wear like a, you know, some kind of military suit in that one. Oh, that would be a good idea. Yeah. Yes. But it's fun. Um, I can, I like that I'll one. get a guitar. Okay, do you have other favorites or other things you're looking forward to with the performance? Yeah. What songs are you looking forward to live? Oh gosh. Um, all the ones that I'm remembering the lyrics to so far. Uh, Neil is a little wordy if you haven't caught on to that. Mm -hmm. uh, he does not write easy songs to it. sing. So yeah. I've been I've been practicing every single day for the last two months uh, to get my chops up. But yeah, there's some moments. I mean, I really, like since I was a kid, Derek, I got really excited about um, kind of pulling emotion out of people singing as a kid i probably didn't really know what that was worth you know or like why i was doing it, it i just kind of maybe i liked the control i don't know um but I, i've always really enjoyed connecting with people on an emotional level about truth and so that's something i don't get to do when we're not performing live which we haven't really for almost a decade really outside of a few isolated well we perform bands. just not as the band on yeah. tour with a moniker Dirple Robbins above our head. So I I almost forget that I enjoy that when I get in front of people and I can see their faces and I can kind of like connect with them over a lyric. Um, that's like my favorite thing. So mm -hmm. in general, the the ballads tend to be like my favorites for that reason or, or, or anything that's just really like a piercing lyric. Um, I get really excited about those moments. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Well, there's these two poles in music and people think they're, they're mutually exclusive. They don't have to be. And one of the polls would be like, let's say you go to YouTube and you watch someone who's ridiculously skilled in practice on their instrument. There's a certain type of titillation you have. Um, it's external. It's like more about impressed with the skill and the tool because you live in a human body and you know how hard that would be to get yourself to the point where you could perform a song or music like that. There's an there, You're impressed by the performer, mm -hmm. right? So that's one aspect of music and then all the way to the other aspect of it where you don't even notice the performance but you're moved internally mm. right so mm. they're like these things seem to be and like people music musicians will form into factions where certain people are more into vibe and that kind of stuff will belittle the technical side they'll be like that's all nonsense look mm. at all these people who are playing incredibly hard music that means nothing they'll mm. point to that and then the other side is like the, for the person who might be heavily involved in like jazz improvisation or, you know, more rigorous classical forms or even like heavy metal can get pretty, uh, require yeah. a certain level of proficiency. There's no joke. Yeah. And they look back at the other people who are doing something simpler and vibe and they're like, oh, they're like, what is this? Like, well, who are these losers? Like, why do they yeah, think they right. can play? And those two things are treated like mutually exclusive, but we've always tried to be both at the same time in the sense that we want you to come and be like, oh, these, these, they've given their life to this thing in, in the in the skill department. But at the same time, like all of that content is to be employed to move people internally. Mm -hmm. um, so there, no one at any point is playing fast or singing high or doing something complex for its own sake because it's hard to pull off or hard to compose. Those things are all happening because we believe it's the right way to get across that emotion and that part of the story at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, and that that feels tricky sometimes because, you know, as we grow in our faith and uh, climb the holy mountain, if you will, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you're you're like dying self. Hopefully you're mm. you're giving up that need for um, validation and eyes on you and attention. And so that's been a funny thing uh, to to kind of move away from that, not care much as much about that, but still have a job to do, you know. And so I, mm. I think what we really care about is changing people's lives with hopefully a truthful message, mm. you know, more than look at me and look what I can do kind of thing. You right. Know? Well, well, the changing someone's life is in like the sense where, um, you know, like what you could say in like in, in a modern televised evangelistic sense where there's like some sort of transaction, like we have a better thing to offer you, right. but there is a mm -hmm. commonality in the human experience that reminds us that there's something more going on in this world. And I think good art hopefully can change that where there's the, the veil peels back for a moment and you realize you're not just random cosmic stardust, um, mm. you know, who came about for their own reasons. In music, we're reminded that there maybe all of this began with a, a better purpose and a higher goal and it's moving towards something better. So that's for us, like doing that with an audience, like trying to make music that does that for us and tell stories that are doing that for us and sharing that with people 
hopefully it makes us all better. You know, mm. hopefully, it, hopefully it adds more dignity to the way you see the people around you, not not mm. this political divisiveness where you otherize and people become less or even even worse, like demons to you. So um, that's that, like so our idea of how things change isn't like the idea that like, hey, you have questions, we have answers like mm. that's not it. It's like, no, like there's these sparks of things you're seeing in your life that you might be ignoring in the modern world when people told you these are just superstitions or that's, you know, just a construct, that story you're telling yourself about your purpose and and our God that created you. Um, no, uh, we don't we don't treat it like that at all. We treat it as if. Um, no, we, we try to take these little sparks and magnify what people are already seeing and experiencing in their life and, mm. and draw it up. And I, that changes me uh, on my day to day life. That changes me. People have had experiences where, um, you know, even people have strange experiences where like suddenly they thought they were just going through life by that, like by themselves and they could do whatever they wanted. And they have this this flash and they voluntarily take on a harder life that's more about serving other people and find themselves way more at peace and way more satisfied by stepping into that than they were prior to selfishly pursuing their own will in the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, anything, good art can really help us have those moments and, and open us mm -hmm. up to what's really going on around us. Um, and so I think that's how I think that's how art changes people, not in the sense that, hey, we put a message, we gave you a transactional proposition and you're going to exercise that transactional proposition and now your life's going to be better. That's not at all. It's, it's all about experiencing um, something that that let, helps you understand that, like, there's a big story here. The stakes are high, but you matter and you're meaningful. Yeah. Now, is this where like one of the tracks that you have is. Beauty will save the world. So is this yep. starting to touch on that track as it pertains to the concept in the album? You want yes. To, yeah. I mean, yes. The answer is yes. Yeah. Um, so there's a there's a really like if you listen to you read some really old stuff on uh how like let's say like so this is interesting. This could be interesting to someone whether they believe it or not, even if they just see it as mythology, but how Christ tricked the devil. Right. So the devil is given um, the devil, the serpent in the Garden of Eden is assigned to eating dust, crawling on his belly. And Adam and Eve, who will die, are told that will return to dust. So now what you might see is there's a proposition that the serpent has and it tells you its motivation. It wants you to die and eat you. Right. That's that. That's the thing. So. Um, so for Satan, who is like, let's just say in, in one sense, like a personification of pride and the dangers of pride, um, who only wants to exercise their own will in the world for its for its own benefit. You know, that's what pride does. It's like this is all for me. Mm -hmm. um, can't see the idea, can't see at the very top that the that the God who made everything could be motivated to suffer. You know, for God to suffer to save people right so this idea that like that someone would use their life as a ransom to rescue people from hell would never occur to the devil so uh this this idea is in our story so we we like to point out the subversive beauty like there is hmm. okay so there is a time when to break to rebel against the system or better yet like reject a system so for example like tricks and lies are normally a problem but if you're a Jew during the Holocaust and you decide to sabotage the Luger, you know, the, the, the guns you're supposed to make for the Nazis the, to malfunction, that's a good act. Right. Mm. So there is there, there's a beauty that that shows up in this sort of like, I'm not going to do what you told me because what you told me to do is going to is killing us. Right. Mm. It's killing everyone or it's idolatry or something like that. Mm. So. Uh, the beauty in this story really shows up in the sense of of will, the beautiful nature of willfully seeing someone who willfully took on suffering and that inspiring you, right, to be someone who does the same. That mm -hmm. you could see that the most beautiful thing you could do is to lay down your life for everyone else you love. And um, I can tell you, you can pray for me because uh, <laughs> I, I'm hoping that I can actually sing that song without crying. Because if I cry, I don't sound very good. <laughs> oh no, Kate. But the song, that song, uh, out of all of them, makes me very emotional. Mm. Well, when you perform, it's, you really want to think about it. I feel like that's yeah. the thesis of our existence as artists. So, like, that's what we've mm. tried to do. You know, 
Mm. So, and, and Neil wrote, I don't think I had any input in that song at all. He wrote all of that, but it's... Uh, I wrote in the key for you to sing. It's a beautiful song. I love oh. that song. Um, I think that's beautiful. So it's, there's always, there's almost always something ironic in beauty. Like, I mean, maybe we talked about this before, but like when you think about where two opposite things, two categorical opposites meet, um, there's always something lovely about it where it meets properly in nature. So for example, day and night are categorical opposites and almost everyone in the world finds sunsets and sunrises uh, objectively beautiful. Right. Um, when someone goes to the beach and they, you know, but actually, so here's the thing, here's what's ironic about it is that um, when you see day and night come together, it doesn't appear to serve a function in the natural world, except that it's an inevitability. Not that like, you know, it's like the daylight sun that grows the plants and it's the nighttime mm -hmm. in which we sleep that that moment is, is merely reduced to some, something is ex, uh, aesthetic for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the beach, you go to the beach and where water meets the land, you don't expect to find a desert, but you do. Right. So there's, there's these wonderful mm -hmm. liminal yes. forms of beauty mm -hmm. that we all objectively appreciate and when we go there, we don't realize it because we're so used to it. But there's always almost something ironic in those moments of how those two things come together. But as human beings, we don't. Why are we so interested in these unions of opposite? And then uh, there's a way these things connect in all kinds of ways in our life. There's all kinds of liminal. Like I love liminal beauty in the sense that where two surprising things come together at the edge of the world. Um, it shows us how every good thing comes into existence. So, you know, one of the, it's incarnational. So like, you can't, you don't want to depersonify these moments. By incarnational, I mean that mankind is incarnated through breath, spirit, right? And then dirt, just generalized dirt. But we see Christ come to the world where the, the father gives the pattern of himself directly to that earth that wasn't just random earth, this particular earth, earth that has moved closer towards the heavens through purity, virginity, devotion, Mm -hmm. um commitment yeah. faithfulness so when you look at that idea you realize this is how every beautiful thing you experience comes into being is that there's the right the perfect pattern the, or the closest to perfect pattern with in a very general sense let's, let's say ingredients so if i'm a chef and i have a recipe and someone gets my food out of a dumpster to make the dinner you're never going to realize the beauty of that recipe right but if someone goes out and finds the finest degree uh, ingredients it will reach its highest potential and then the beauty of the the meal will be received so mm -hmm. this is the thing about joining like the immaterial to the material the idea to uh the substance um the theory to the examples that come out yeah. so yeah. Mm -hmm. um people people think beauty is in the eye of the beholder but i think they're dead wrong because they're focused on their mm -hmm. idiosyncratic pleasures and tastes as opposed to that there's things that we all recognize as beautiful. And categorically, they're always when two things that are opposites are brought together, right? And their distance is removed and their union becomes fruitful. Something mm -hmm. beautiful comes out of that, whether it's a man and a woman coming together to make a child, whether it's day and night coming together to make sunset or sunrise, whether it's the salty dead ocean meeting the, the alive and vibrant land. Um, these moments are things we go to where the heavens meet the earth on the top of the mountain. People are attracted to these things. They're reliable. You can turn them into tourist locations because we know objectively <laughs> mm. people want to go to these places. Right. And so I think that, you know, the, the notion that beauty is subjective is like, you're, you're talking about things you like and, ple and find pleasurable. You're not really talking about what's beautiful because what's beautiful is beyond your ability to explain, but not beyond your ability to experience. Mm -hmm. mm. So good deal. Hey, thanks. There's a, been a lot of questions online. I guess I would say this at the end about AI because on this record, uh, one of the things we didn't touch on is that it does deal with the problem of AI and what AI, mm -hmm. like deep faking, is a part of the story. Um, so you know, one of the things about a martyrdom is always a problem when there's an opposition that willfully dies for its cause because it inspires and stiffens the spines of other people around them. Um, mm -hmm. But what about the near future time where people stop preaching against the state and then reappear and are preaching for the state, right? So the idea that you can eliminate someone and then through deep fakery, they never go away as far as the general public is concerned, right? They can become a part. They can steal that person's image, the sound of their voice for their own propaganda and message. So um, this is part of the story. But so also as I was doing that, it was kind of fun because I started experimenting 
with what I can do with AI art. Um, and this is really triggering to some people. people mad, Neil. Some people get so mad Ooh. because, well, especially as, okay. So especially up and coming artists, people who do visual, visual art see an existential threat with this. Which oh. is understandable. Yeah, of course they do. Yeah, and fair enough. Um, yeah, of course they do, right? Because, but this is not, this isn't the first time this happened in the world. So like when drum machines came out, drummers were scared, oh, you know, yeah. uh, when, when sampling I mean, came out, sample, they're like, oh no, yeah. they're going to get rid of orchestras now. And, not auto tune. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it goes on and on. Yeah. So, but generally what happens is, is that no, it, the, the, the truer form of it becomes more valuable, even though mm -hmm. it becomes more rare and that we find out what we were interested in all along was what a human could do with a drum machine, not what a drum machine could do by itself. Mm -hmm. So um, there's- Which is very little actually. There's this excitement. You, the yeah, there's excitement. Like, so when I go into mid journey the first time and I'm trying to use it and I type in something like funny, right? Mm -hmm. What it gives you back so quickly is very impressive, mm -hmm. right? So the problem is, is that people see that and they're like, oh no. Um, the problem is, is that if you are an artist who has a specific result in mind it never gives you that mm -hmm. it doesn't so right away when mm -hmm. i started realizing like oh ai is going to be part of the story it's i need unruly. to make it i need to make it part of the visual image R right away i realized i couldn't use what it gave me i would have to cut mm -hmm. it up and pull components out if i was going to mm -hmm. massage it into a point where it had life where it wasn't just this thing that was kind of related to what we were talking about yeah so right away it like helped me realize like one, what the real dangerous AI is, is this stuff, this is, it's a playground right now. It's a toy, like um, AI art. Um, it's not particularly dangerous because for the people who are like, oh no, it's going to replace us. It's like, listen, a forklift has always lifted more weight than you, mm -hmm. right? A, but there's still strongman competitions. Like, why don't we have forklift competitions <laughs> uh, where forklifts are driving around by themselves, right? Competing Might be or, fun. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, a cheetah has always been faster than a man. A horse has been faster than a man, but still, like humans play most of the sports on human legs. And because I think what we're interested in, we don't think about this enough, but we have bodies we live in. And when someone pushes that body to the max in whatever skill it is, whether it's painting, whether it's dunking a basketball, we're impressed in the same way I was talking about with music because we have a body and we right. know how hard that is to do if we've ever tried. Mm -hmm. Now, like, you know, Beach volleyball might look it, like easy on television, but then you go and try to do it and you feel like a squid trying to run around in the sand. You realize these professionals are actually incredibly skillful. Yeah. And it's the same yeah. with art, the same with music. So we've noticed we've had plenty of time o over the years to be like, oh, like this, you know, like the forklift analogy again, it can lift so much more weight than a person, but we're still going to watch strongman competitions because you know what it's like to be in a human body and try to lift you know, 100 pounds, mm -hmm. never mind 400 pound boulder, these are flipping a car. Well, I, I actually love the um, integration of AI that you've been doing with art. I mean, I'm, I know this is controversial, but for me, it's, uh, you know, coming from that musical theater background and the theatrics and the symbolism, I've always felt like there needed to be a visual component to what we were doing. And especially like, I really felt like we needed music videos, but I didn't want it to just be like a singing. That was never like, we didn't want the, you know, normal. And in fact, Peter Gabriel would be an example of someone who like his inspirational, his old school mm -hmm. music videos are so cool. Yeah. But, uh, you know, to, to pay for that as an independent artist, mm -hmm. when the money in the music industry has kind of fallen apart over the last two decades, it's just, it's impossible. So mm -hmm. like what we can do with AI art is to actually bring some of this to life. So I, I'm kind of a big Well, fan. the pushback is that sadly, yeah. that might have been my impression going into it. It not saved me an ounce of time ever <laughs> because immediately yeah. I realized I didn't love generative AI. I didn't love its randomness. I didn't love the fact that it was totally ripping off other people's styles. So what I started to do right away is I started to infuse our own artwork, even the movie Queen of the Night scenes from that, the artwork from that. And then, you know, juxtapose more 80s colors to it. And also I realized that if I, even if I started with a sketch of my own to, to determine the composition of some kind of art, it went way better than if I just left it to the computer. So what happened with AI right away is I realized that like, okay, so as an artist, you're trying to figure out how to put life into the machine. So, you know, uh, in the language of creation, he talks about the symbolism of a brass instrument where you, or a horn, you, it's a dead horn from an animal. It's a dead part of an animal. Um, that you breathe spirit into, right? And it vibrates and it comes to life. So this is this is what music is, is that you're bringing a dead thing to life and you're trying to see, 
yeah. how much of our human experience and relatable experience you can bring to that instrument. Mm -hmm. So this has happened all along. A, vel a ventriloquist is doing what what we're doing with AI. So a ventriloquist takes a little form of a person, looks like a person, right? And then they they play this trick on you where you become, begin to believe it's a separate persona. It's a, it's a different locus of consciousness than the, um, than the ventriloquist himself. And so it's a game they're playing with the audience bringing to life. The same thing's happened with computers ever since computers have existed. It's the same thing as picking up a dead horn and breathing life into it. So mm. I think what we're gonna see, because AI isn't going anywhere, I think people, um, I, I don't think people should worry about the artistic side yet. I think I can tell you the side they should wor be have been worried about for a long yeah, time. What's that? Um, okay, well, hold on one second. Let me finish. Um, so um, you're doing the same thing. A, a real artist who picks up this stuff is going to try to breathe as much emotion and life into the machine as possible to see how far it can go. Um, to see if you can, if it can be bent into coming to life and looking like something that's relatable to a human being okay so the most dangerous form is i'll, I'll share it like this I, I found this meme and it wasn't even a meme it was just a picture it, it was um it was a rainy day and it was raining into a swimming pool like really hard and it's standing in the low end of the swimming pool where four teenagers huddled under an umbrella in the mm -hmm. pool so the problem is they're worried about these raindrops meanwhile they're submerged in halfway submerged in water so I would say that like, as of right now, like the deep faking, generative art, even the non-generative AI engine. So for the people that complain about, so the problem is people have this knee jerk reaction anytime they see AI or anything that could be AI is that you're ripping someone off. The problem is that that excuse is almost all, already going away because artists, visual artists are training the thing to do their own style. And simultaneously, there are really strong non-generative, meaning that, that aren't borrowing from previous images, non-generative forms of art that are gonna replace those anyway, because they're safer and the legality isn't in question. So mm -hmm. people who are using that argument, that argument is already gone. Um, but anyway, the the most dangerous form of AI is not the art, it's not these little things, it's not even ChatGPT, as, as weird as ChatGPT is, it doesn't really understand things yet. If we understand the anthropology of consciousness we can understand that chat gpt is very far away from anything like a conscious entity mm -hmm. not that it's not powerful the most dangerous thing is something where your people who are watching your channel right now are swimming in and people who come to my channel so the one of the funniest comments was i got from someone um because every once in a while i say one out of like 40 comments if i do something that has any ai in it someone's gonna give me a speech and the and i totally get i'm with actually with them i normally agree with them to some degree um but they'll say this someone's like I praise the algorithm for um, for leading us to you, but I'm disappointed to see you're using AI in your art. And what they didn't realize is that they just praised AI mm -hmm. and then rejected AI at the same time. Like they didn't understand that there was a contradiction in what they were saying, that there actually was a more dangerous AI. So as opposed to an AI who's trying to make art that looks human, people thinking that's the ultimate bad, how about the AI that is designed to know your interest, track your interest, and sell and you stuff. Farm you exactly. Mm -hmm. Farm the maximum amount of time and attention to you, and then sell you stuff. Mm -hmm. Because the problem is with the computer, there's no consciousness there in the sense of some kind of moral sense. Because the the engine will show you more and more strange things that you have more of a reaction to. Because the longer you're online, the more you're going to be worn out by it. And so it's going to have to get more and more extreme mm. to keep you engaged. Mm -hmm. So this thing has already been trained on you, your taste, your interest. It has a profile. It's going to try to show you things that keep you there watching ads and spending your money. Um, this has been around and then it functions almost perfectly to do mm. this task already. So we're all swimming in AI. And I don't think it's particularly dangerous if you're aware of how it works, because right. it's just like being around a manipulative person. If you're if you're onto the game, it's like listen, you're not like if you're onto the tricks that are being employed, they don't work, right? Mm -hmm. There's a there's a conscious engagement in that type of magic that you can reject. So my bigger concern is that like people like in politics get get really concerned with something for the wrong reasons. It's not a part of really a part of affecting mm -hmm. them, and simultaneously just swallow this bigger pill. Right. And it, and uh, become totally unaware of the ways we're selling our soul. Yeah. So that's it. I think that the the algorithm is is the most effective 
and most dangerous AI out there. And people are mm. standing right. up to their up to their waist in it for certain. Mm -hmm. If you're using any of these uh, platforms, so that's the one you need to watch out for. But by all means, watch out for all the other stuff. I mean, I'm very glad that like our next project, I won't have to engage with any of this. It's all. It's all practical elements. I'm even for the one of the films we're working on. I'm even trying to hire this wonderful um, magician to do most of the stuff practically on set without camera cuts and some of the things that happen in it. I'm excited about that. So it's like when you see it, you're actually not seeing a special effect. You're seeing the thing actually happen. Mm -hmm. So been working on that. So uh, I'm excited to get away from AI, but I think that people's pushback is understood, but. I think their fears are misplaced that they should, mm -hmm. the thing that's already controlling them they sh is the one they should be paying attention, not the one that could necessarily um, be detrimental to their career in the future. Cause it's the AI is going to be detrimental to careers. It's just what it is. Mm -hmm. So when you look you at know, the you movies get... that came out, even this year, the, the low budget, low CGI, you know, in-person action movies, those are the ones that did the best and had the best reception. <laughs> and so I'm, I, maybe it's, that's already carrying over to music. Um, we'll see. Yeah, music is way behind on the AI front. They can't, yeah. Mu the AI can't do music. It does, unfortunately. <laughs> so someone put up a version of our song Babylon where the AI replaced my voice with someone who actually sounds very similar. It's this character from a, a steampunk um, show. <laughs> and, uh, but the computer did that. And that was kind of cool and fun to hear, like hearing your own voice in the background vocals sucked out of it and replaced with AI. Yeah, but for it to you know, they, your, like to yeah. write like original content, it's not. Yeah, I mean, again, else. I think that people were interested. We're interested in what other people can do. This has been a problem for a long time in the sense that let's just say Pro Tools or these programs, you can edit and tune everything so much that it lowered the stakes when you're listening to music. Um, by that, I mean, I noticed this myself. So there was, uh, when I would produce other projects, there are certain styles of music where you really got to like, this is going to have the tuning of the vocals going to have to be pegged mm -hmm. and the drums and everything's going to have to hit right on the grid. And as I'd work on that music, I'd have a tough time listening back and keeping in, because you have to listen so closely for, for weird things that appear and mixing. I found it so hard to stay engaged because you knew the stakes were low. You knew in a way, it, you don't feel like the thing really happened mm -hmm. and a, a human was really a part of it. It sounds so much on a grid. It's going to, you expect it to function like you expect your car to turn on when you run it. So mm -hmm. it has a way of lowering the stakes. So I don't see AI art and AI music replacing people ultimately at the end of the day, even if it can match your compositional ability, even if it can beat you lyrically, um, a computer, a book, a book has always had a better memory than you. Hmm. The book remembers every word, right? It doesn't, it's not conscious of any of those words like a computer and what they actually mean, but it remembers all those words. And uh, you still need to use your memory, right? Mm -hmm. So the, all these things are like, there are, there is a problem. There is a fall in, involved in it. There is a moving away from, uh, there is the potential to move away from an embodied human experience. But at the same time, good artists are going to use whatever you give them on the table and they're going to figure out how to make it come to life. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as a person at home has that spark and that ability to create interesting content, they got nothing to worry about because that's going to be, um, that's the the commodity that people are going to care about forever because we live in human bodies yeah. and we have a human experience. So they're, the computers are not going to be as interesting to us as people are afraid in the future. Yeah. What did you think, Kate? Amen. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm and curious. We talk about these the, things like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. What has the, the creative time, process like, been like for you guys in the making of this album? Because I mean, you guys are you're you have a beautiful family, nice big family. You are homeschooling. You're running a small creative business, like, and you guys have just produced yeah. this beautiful content. And I, so, w what has it been like on this album for you two? Um, for me, well, it's been different. Well, yeah, different. I think Neil's kind of dragged me in to be a part of the writing a little bit more than I have in, on the last two projects. Because again, one, you know, once I kind of took over homeschooling, by the end of the day, I don't have a lot of creative juice left. <laughs> so um, not that I can't write, but it, it's just not, uh, it's not necessary. Um, 
And so he, he has kind of, I think, almost forced me into the writing process a little bit more this time, which I appreciate. I, well, I get her input on everything either way, whether I create it or not. And generally, very few things that she doesn't like get on a record. Um, There's not be, many. Sorry, go ahead. No, because we're making it together. At the same time, dude, it's, it gets, I'm a, I mean, you probably already guessed this. I'm kind of a people person. Mm -hmm. um, I like being around people and out of because there's so many tools where you can kind of do everything yourself and you have that, that producer instinct where you can kind of take visual mediums and, and work them up to your own taste and audio and all these things that I've learned to do everything by myself. And I've kind of cut myself off from the joy of, of accomplishing something with other people. So mm -hmm. I've, I've come to realize that as much as efficient, as much as I really like the result, um, it's harder for me to grind through without an audience or not, never mind an audience like friends to do it with. So uh, yeah, but Kate I mean, Neil's gets grinding. sucked into that. He's grinding from like before I wake up in the morning, usually till, I mean, he takes breaks and he's here in the house with us. So the kids get to see him a lot, but mm -hmm. I mean, he's a hard working man. Yeah. When I'm on an uh, album cycle, it, Everybody knows like my, I'm going to put my head down for two months and then we're going to we're going to hang out again. So I, I kind of flit in and out of that, you know, like he'll drag, mm -hmm. he'll be like, OK, I need an hour of your time to like edit some of these lyrics. I, I don't come up with original ideas, but I might be able to find a word that I like better than whatever he came up with or something yeah, that flows yeah. nicer when it's sung. So I kind of think of myself more as an editor at this point in what we do or just like the yes and no man. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like yeah okay yeah well, so the uh, so the other problem we run into yeah. is that like when we used to be more of a live band you start incorporating new songs at the end of your album cycle for the previous record so when we did our first record we only had one record we started to, at the end of that record cycle playing live we started slipping in new stuff and what's beautiful about that is that everybody who has to record the song begins to get familiar with it. You start to find little things you can do with the song, like as a singer. So when we just write, so basically I'll write stuff in my head, then I'll write it down and I'll show it to Kate. And then she comes to the studio to sing it. So we, we've been working on more ways to like incorporate what would have happened naturally by performing in front of an audience mm. before we record the record. Cause I think it's really unfair to singers and, and people to be like, hey, this song you've never heard before that people are going to listen to over and over again for the next 20 years. Um, let me teach it to you right now in five minutes. And then you sing your first impression of that. <laughs> right. It's not it's not like a slow cooker, like a meal that's coming together and in, in coming together slowly over time. It, it seems to be something very manufactured if we do it that way. So we're always looking for ways to that's tricky to do things. So getting her involved on that part of it earlier, even giving her stuff to go and, you know, practice and own and then letting her, of course, like sometimes like lyrics, it's like, it looks great on paper. When you, when you start to say it out loud, there's clunky things about it. Yes. Yeah. And yes. so I like yeah. when things flow, like, and, and I mean, we're big into alliteration and those kind of things. So I'm always yeah. looking for that. And so by handing it off to her, she chips off like a nail file, all the rough edges that, yeah. that, right. that feel rigid once you actually start to perform them. So she'll chip those things off if I give them to her early enough. But my my days, Derek, are, are very much like most of the ladies who are taking care of children and homeschooling, you know, mm. like I'm doing laundry and dishes and cooking yeah. and teaching. And um, so- Except she's singing while she's doing it. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, that's been the funny thing is like- I'm practicing for the for summit, I promise. <laughs> yeah, getting ready for that. So I've had to like put in, okay, I have to at least sing through this set like once a day. I got to pick this guitar up. And yeah. it's funny because the kids will kind of walk in and out of the kitchen where I'm practicing yeah. and just kind of like start laughing at me. So I'm just constantly being mocked like mm -hmm. every day while I prepare. Yeah. Which is probably good for me in some way or another. So. Oh, yeah. Our kids think we're a joke with our career. It's yeah. great. No, they or if we get recognized when we're out in public or something like that. It's the most They're annoying so thing that can happen yeah. to them. They're like, oh, this yeah. Is That's a great part yeah. of growing up. Parental yeah. embarrassment. I mean, yeah. what would a childhood be without it? Honestly. No. You know? Oh, yeah. All of them. I was like, you guys are going to sing with us, right? Because we have a couple. Uh, we use them on our records. And they're like, no way. I'm not singing with you. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> okay fine we'll find somebody else to they're it. funny though because like it's like they don't want to be in the movie and then they don't want to not be in the movie either yeah you know so mm -hmm. like when yeah. we do stuff like that it's like hey i don't want to be on the song but then later they want to hear themselves singing it so they they have this kind of conundrum um we make them because we know they'll be sad yeah. about it once they grow yeah. up so. make them we yeah, bribe we them. them it's a bribe 
yeah totally oh. yeah well i mean the kids don't like help me cut grass or bring in the firewood all the time but um yeah. we do that you know it's part of the family <laughs> that's right the family right. trade right yeah exactly well Dar i appreciate you having us on not to wrap it up on you uh but the band getting close uh, there waiting to rehearse yeah, we gotta yeah. Get is he starting to glow dance. brighter over there your dj <laughs> he's starting to you don't want to make the guy in the disco ball suit angry yeah nice and then who knows we might be coming to a city near you so mm. you're welcome enough, to the edge of the world more. over here in california i'd love to um it'd be great i love california um i just can't afford to live there so uh <laughs> and uh don't necessarily want to pay those kind of taxes um anyway um yeah so that's what we've got going on derek um some live stuff on our youtube channel we've got a bunch of lyric videos coming out so we're doing a we're doing something that we should never do which is the the closing encore song for our set is a song no one's ever heard before oh, so wow. yeah well if someone's on the symbolic summit list we might send it out kind of like hey get hyped for the concert and here's a song early uh, um okay. so okay. if someone signs up for a ticket or buys the virtual ticket they might get access to a song a little early okay. um so that's it not okay. selling anything there but it's just a reality yeah that stay they tuned want something. yeah okay neil thank you very much i will cut you loose i'll let you back to your band members so you can practice thanks the big show no, I appreciate you having us on. I love your channel. Uh, you got to catch up with your last video that aired during a practice. So uh, with you and Richard, I oh, love yeah. Richard. Finally going to get to meet him in person um, at the summit. So that's going to be yeah. great. Right, it always man. seems like my kind of people. Okay, we'll see you soon, Neil. All right, you got it. <laughs>